you know, clarinet doubling is not a new thing. People think, oh, it's just related to 20th century music, maybe Paul Whiteman's band people think of. But the truth is, doubling goes back many, many years, and uh, specifically for the clarinet, uh, in the 18th century, the Mannheim Orchestra was the top orchestra uh, pretty much in Europe during that time. And it was customary for the oboists there to pick up the clarinet, uh, and usually in uh, other, like an odd movement, like the third movement, as a color change. But uh, this was not something that was thought of as unique or unusual. It was commonplace. Oboists played flute. Uh, bassoonists played uh, flute. As well, I mean, so doubling in woodwinds it goes back to the early days of orchestral writing, um, and in fact, the clarinet is responsible, in a sense, for the popularity of the saxophone. Uh, the clarinet uh, was the instrument of choice of Classe. We all know about Classe and Louis Mayer, but those were two of the earliest great saxophone players in the 19th century. The first great saxophone player was the fellow who invented it, Adolf Sax who many of you also know invented the bass clarinet. Sax was a virtuoso clarinetist and flutist, and he held jobs in uh, regional orchestras around Brussels uh, on both instruments. So when he built the saxophone, he built it based on his knowledge of the flute and clarinet. And so it was a little easier, therefore, for clarinet players to adapt to the saxophone because of the similarity of the single reed. And that help the saxophone get started. And so when we talk about doubling in the 20th century and now in the 21st century for clarinet, we are actually talking about it from a saxophone perspective. The saxophone is the main instrument for a woodwind doubler in today's lingo. Clarinet is one of the doubles. It is the, in my opinion, the most important and first double because saxophone and clarinet are so intertwined. In fact, some of the greatest saxophone players in the 20th century started on clarinet. Rudy Wiedoft, who was basically responsible for the popularity of the saxophone in this country, was originally a clarinet player. Uh, so was Jimmy Dorsey. And in fact, in the most popular bands of the 1920s, jazz bands, Fletcher Henderson's band, all three gentlemen in the reed section who were Buster Bailey, Don Redmond, and Coleman Hawkins all played clarinet before they played saxophone and all played clarinet on the band. They had arrangements that included clarinet with the saxophone. Same thing held true for Paul Whiteman's band, which was the most popular band in the country in the 1920s. Whiteman's original three men, who were Ross Gorman, Hale Byers, and Don Clark, all played clarinet on the book along with numerous other instruments. So the clarinet saxophone double has a long history in its construction as well in its players. As it pertains to musical theater, the clarinet was considered one of the four orchestral woodwinds that were always written for in musicals. Probably one of the greatest musicals ever written, one of the earliest big success stories was Showboat in 1927, a Jerome Kern musical orchestrated by Robert Russell Bennett. And the orchestration for that was flute, oboe, two clarinets, and bassoon. Five woodwinds. That was a typical orchestration for woodwinds. No doubling, just what we call straight chairs, orchestral chairs. Things started to change using saxophone and clarinet on chairs in the 20s because of the popularity of the jazz bands. And in the early 30s, there was a musical by Cole Porter called Anything Goes. And that really changed the whole course of woodwind doubling in musical theater and, quite frankly, put it on its uh, track to being a requirement in commercial music. Uh, let me read you the chairs that were in Anything Goes. Uh, it's a little interesting. There are three reed players. The first reed player played clarinet, alto sax, and flute. The second reed player played clarinet, alto sax, oboe, and English horn. The third reed player played clarinet, tenor sax, and bass clarinet. And so Anything Goes was a huge success. And as we know, when things are a huge success, and it saved the producers money because instead of hiring five women players, now they hired three. And they got more instruments for it. So the result was doubling became a requirement in the musical theater world, and it has remained so. Uh, we're talking about doubling in musical theater today, quite frankly, because it's the one area in the music business that has the most amount of work for doubling. It is the one area that is likely to maintain that 
in the future. At one point in the 20th century, people who played saxophone, clarinet, and flute minimally, some also played like Rick Obo or Devin also played bassoon, found work in the Hollywood staff orchestras, on radio, TV, in the big bands, freelance engagements on tours with singers, doing record dates, doing jingles. These were very profitable and good times for uh, people who were multi-instrumentalists. That pretty much ended in the 1990s. And what we have left now is, quite frankly, the musical theater, which today is doing very well. Let me give you some statistics for what's happening right now in, on Broadway, which influences musical theater throughout the country. This past season, 2016-2017, we had 29 musicals running. I think we currently have 21 at the moment. But during the season, there were 29 musicals. Some have closed. In the 29 musicals, there were 69 woodwind chairs. Of those 69 woodwind chairs, 45 <coughs> excuse me, were clarinet doubling chairs, clarinet, saxophone, some flute, oboe, and so forth. There were three clarinet chairs, meaning just clarinet or clarinet, bass clarinet, E-flat clarinet. One of them was Phantom of the Opera, which is 28 years, so we don't even count that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Nor should we. Um, uh, the other two chairs uh, were in musicals, one of which is closed. So basically, right now on Broadway, there are two chairs, uh, two players that hold down just straight clarinet chairs, whereas there are 45 chairs that include clarinet and other instruments. This brings to the point that, well, if one wants to work outside of the realm of orchestral or chamber music jobs, which are few and far between, let's be honest, this is a vehicle, this is a possibility for those young players who are thinking, well, I love clarinet, and maybe I love other musics, and maybe I might enjoy playing the saxophone. And then when you get into it, maybe picking up a flute or a double reed might also, you might find that enjoyable. But if we're talking about young people who are talented, and we've heard so many talented young players at this conference already, the chances for them to have a performing career on clarinet solely in this country, I'm going to tell you this because I've lived through academia, and I know very few people tell the truth about this. There are very few jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's a crime. And it's not the fault of the talented young players. It's the fault of our culture. We don't support the arts enough. But we're not going to change that here. The point is looking at the reality. And the reality is that musical theater offers jobs that pay a decent wage, pay benefits and pension, and that's not something to sneeze at in the musical world today. And so what we hope to do is here is give you a little perspective on the fact that here is an alternative uh, direction to go for young players who really might find that they love other musics in addition to the great orchestral music, ballet music, opera music, chamber music. They might like some commercial music. They might like pop music. They might like funk and rock as well. And so what we all experience is a, is a um, great diversity of music in our life because of the instruments we play and the musical situations that we can play in, playing instruments in addition to clarinet. So. Some people think, well, maybe that's like giving up or it's not succeeding. Uh -uh. There's nothing to stop you from playing chamber music, nothing to stop you from working in orchestras. All of us have played in freelance orchestras in and around the uh, New York metropolitan area, which are now down here in the southern frontier of the country. You can do other jobs. The beauty of Broadway in musical theater is that you can take off. On Broadway right now, our contract allows us to take off up to 50% of the time and still hold our chair and do other work. There's no other job in the music industry that allows that. And so, I think instead of limiting one, actually being a, a, a commercial player on the doubles, playing clarinet, saxophone, flute, maybe even double reeds, enhances your workability, enhances your musical uh, sensitivity, and maybe adds in a sense, a little bit of life security as far as being a player. So that's what we hope to do a little bit today and push you in that direction. Um, we're going to continue uh, with two selections from a current hit Broadway show, Aladdin, which was based on a Disney film uh, a while back. 
um, in the 1990s, I think it was 1992 when the film came out. Uh, Aladdin opened in 2014, still running strong. And so these are two short selections that'll show you uh, how the clarinet is being used in contemporary Broadway writing and involving doubling. In some instances, you'll see us making very fast switches. In the second excerpt that we're going to play, you're going to see us, uh, I think I am one, I'm going to be, and Rick too, we're going to be hanging our saxophone while we're playing another instrument because the switches are so fast. Uh, we're going to use the soundtrack from the cast album as a background. Generally, clarinet and saxophone can use the same basic embouchure. There are going to be a few little differences in pressure, in, you know, firmness, things like that. But basically, whatever works for one will work for the other. So if you're studying with a teacher on each instrument, they're advocating something very different from the other person. That's going to cause you some problems. So I would try to settle on something that you feel will work for you. Um, the differences between the two instruments I'll deal with later when I talk about air strength. Um, the next thing is, uh, is technique. So, as you know, the clarinet overblows a 12th, which is very different than the other woodwinds. So, I think clarinet is probably the hardest instrument technically. So, if you're a clarinetist already, you're going to have a much easier time. So, for example, obviously, you know, all fingers down, low G, right? You push the register key, you have a D. In the saxophone, all fingers down is a D the octave key and you get another D. So it's a lot less complicated. Um, <laughs> oh, anybody can play the saxophone. <laughs> but there are some funny things that happen between the instruments. A um, couple examples. On the clarinet, if you play with the thumb and register key and, and one and one, it's an alternate B flat fingering. On the oboe, that's a C natural. So confusing until you get the hang of that. Um, uh, another thing is, uh, again, with the octave key and, and uh, the register key and thumb. This is E flat, this is C. On the oboe, this is C, this is E flat. I don't know why they did that. <laughs> One more example, um, same thing, thumb, register key, three fingers, first finger, right hand, F natural, right? The oboe, it's F sharp. <laughs> so uh, these are just things that you need to deal with. And uh, you know, once you get the hang of it, you know, I, I remember I started on the saxophone, and when I was playing clarinet in a fast passage, I would revert to saxophone fingerings because my brain just couldn't deal with it. So, but eventually you sort of figure it out, and uh, it becomes second nature to you. Um, one of the other difficulties, um, oh, sorry, I forgot something with the, with the embouchure. 
all the instruments except for the flute. Your upper lip is against your teeth. And with the, with the oboe and bassoon, obviously, is a double lip on there. You do this type of thing. So the difficulty with, with the flute for doublers is trying to get that upper lip to be relaxed and loose and away from your teeth. And that can be a very difficult thing. In my current show, Anastasia, I'm not only playing oboe and English horn, but I'm playing all the flute solos and piccolo as well. So, and I often have, you know, a four bar rest to get from oboe to piccolo or oboe to flute. And boy, that's not an easy thing to do. You, you know, you eventually figure it out, but um, it's one of the big challenges that, that we have to deal with. Uh, okay, so the third topic is Airstream, which as I said, I think is the most important uh, thing in playing the different instruments. I think of the clarinet and the oboe as being opposite extremes. Let me show you. You probably won't be able to see that in the back, but everyone knows what the diameter of the clarinet mouthpiece is at the end. And that's basically what the top of the bore of the clarinet is, give or take, right? The oboe reed, that very small opening there, that's the top of the oboe bore, right? So if you try to blow with the same intensity into the oboe as you do with the clarinet, you're not going to have very good luck. I think of the clarinet as being the most concentrated airstream, sort of like a, you know, like a, a, a fairly small diameter tube in the air, moving at a fairly good clip, right? The oboe, you can't do that. You have to play a much more diffused airstream. Think about the difference between a hose with water rushing out of it and a hose that has a nozzle on the end. Just do this gentle spray with the nozzle to water your flowers or something. That's more of what the oboe airstream is like. And because of that, you can play very long phrases. In fact, most of the time on the oboe, when you get to an end of a phrase, you actually have to exhale before you inhale. So you'll hear an oboe player here. Very quick. Exhale, inhale. And if you don't do that, the carbon dioxide will build up in your bloodstream and you'll start to get could be a good hobby for you, but uh, <laughs> I don't really recommend that. So the flute is a very different concept. Um, the problem with the flute is there's nothing to blow against. There's no resistance. There's no reed in your mouth, no mouthpiece in your mouth. So if you're not careful, the air is just going to rush right out, and you're going to be playing, you know, two-note phrases. So and I remember when I was starting on flute, I would get very dizzy because I was taking breaths so often, you know, because the air just goes. So you need to find a way to preserve your air so that you can play longer phrases. Okay, so the big difference to me between the saxophone and the clarinet is, is again, the airstream. If you play the saxophone with that clarinet airstream, that very directed airstream, you're not going to get a good result. And we've all heard people who are clarinetists try to play the saxophone for the first time. It's not going to sound very good. You're going to get a very tight, very narrow kind of pinched sound, and it's not going to work has to be a much more diffuse kind of sound. There's still a lot of air coming out, but I think of it as being a wider, sort of more spread out kind of air stream. You can't drive the air through or it's not going to work. And the lower the saxophones go, you know, soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, the more so that's in effect. Think about if, you're, if you play bass clarinet also. You can't play the bass clarinet the way you play the clarinet. You have to make some adjustments. I think that's I think that's about about it in terms of the air. Um. Mm.
to talk a little bit about success uh, as a woodwind doubler. So first I wanted to try to define success, which can be a, a very nebulous word. Success means different things to different people. Success as a woodwind doubler has to start, though, with what, what Ed has, with each one of us here have, is a love for music and a love for the instrument that we're playing. As a woodwind player, as Ed referenced earlier, we start on a primary instrument, saxophone for instance, and then follow it up with another instrument and another instrument. Each one of these instruments requires an absolutely intense study, a period of time to study this instrument. You have to really visualize yourself and imagine yourself being a flutist, a real flutist. You're studying the repertoire, you're studying with a professional teacher who might be playing in a symphony orchestra, who might be teaching at a university, who has a a real breadth and depth of knowledge in that particular specialty instrument. And you live that in your mind, in your practice habits. You devote yourself 150% to that instrument for a, an extended period of time. Let me kind of back up just a quick second. As we all know, playing an instrument, we do this from a young age. Once that instrument, those fundamentals have been developed, the ability to read music, ability to understand basic hand position. Uh, Rick was talking about production in detail about production of air and embouchure. We developed this on one primary instrument. Many of the people in this room are clarinetists and have the clarinet as a primary instrument. We will transfer, as Rick was saying, some of these things to the other instruments, but there has to be a point, a period, in that study of that secondary instrument where it's no longer secondary. It's not a double. It's a primary instrument in your mind. You're no longer at that moment that you're playing the saxophone. You're, uh, you are, you are a saxophonist, not a clarinetist at that moment. They want to hear the saxophone. They want to hear, for instance, if you sound like you're in Count Basie's band, uh, or like you should be sound like you're in Count Basie's band. Uh, so the study of instruments with a professional teacher is absolutely critical for an extended period of time, enough time to develop. Uh, I think Ed referenced this earlier, or maybe Rick where things become intuitive. You pick the instrument up, and as we all know, when you pick the instrument up, you have a certain sort of uh, subconscious reaction to what you're doing. You go to play, uh, and like for instance, if you all can imagine when you picked up an A clarinet for the first time, and you went to play an open G, and it just did not sound or feel right, because you're used to blowing a certain way on the soprano, B-flat soprano clarinet, and so you had to learn how to play that A clarinet. The bass clarinet, for those of you that might have played that as a clarinetist, Again, that's a very steep learning curve initially. So for each one of these things, we have to live with that instrument. This requires a serious commitment on a number of levels, and one is uh, simply financially being able to acquire the instruments, the equipment, the mouthpieces. Again, I come back to the common theme of love, love and passion for what you do. It's a constant quest, a constant search for mouthpieces, for reeds, for that sound that you're trying to develop in your mind and execute through your instrument. So when you're studying the flute, you may want to emulate Jean-Pierre Rompal, you may want to em emulate Julius Baker, and you have these sounds in your, in your ear. You may want to emulate as a clarinet Stanley Drucker. You have these sounds, these recordings. So it's absolutely not just mandatory, but it has to stem from, from the passion inside you, the love inside you for this music and these instruments to want to live with these recordings to live with these recordings, go to live concerts um, for these specific instruments. The investment in the instruments may not come back immediately. You invest in a bass clarinet, for instance, and you get one gig that pays you $175, and that doesn't equal a return of a $14,000 bass clarinet, certainly. But you learn to play that instrument, and again, through the passion and through the, the love of what you're doing, you actually learn about Stravinsky now. You learned about uh, Mahler, for instance, playing some music that you might not have played as a saxophonist, for instance. So the investment in the inst instruments initially, it, the advice I always give to people is buy the absolute best instrument that you possibly can afford. It doesn't mean to go mortgage a house necessarily to buy a whole set of instruments initially. This takes time over years. All these guys here, uh, and there's many women uh, woodwind players working on Broadway ab ab absolutely at, at this point. Uh, have done this over time. I just bought a piccolo last year, a Powell piccolo. It cost me almost $7,000. I don't play piccolo anymore professionally in, uh, 
in New York anymore, but I, I do occasionally get called to do it, and I did it quite a bit when I was in New York, and I like to play a very, very good instrument. It was worth the investment. I, got, I, I played with Johnny Mathis a couple of years ago in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I had a very, very good instrument, and it, it made the gig, uh, ex I could execute the gig to the way I, you know, the level I wanted to. The, so the return uh, of your investment on a particular mouthpiece, an neck strap, uh, something that you're using, your equipment, is uh, not going to come back immediately, but it's absolutely a, you know, the highest priority. Practicing, we have to practice. How do you divide your practice up? Success as a woodwind player equals a, a lot of sort of behind the scenes hours that all of these people put in to their instruments, their study, attending concerts, talking to colleagues. In an overarching way, we study one instrument for a, an extended period of time, and then like I said before, study another instrument for an extended period of time. In the actual day of practice, I divide my practice up uh, do, do, doing some sort of warm-up, some sort of technical thing, and then I get into my, uh, my repertoire. Three general categories. So I'm just going to talk to you briefly about, if you're a young person uh, looking to break into the Broadway scene, uh, some tips of what you can do. Uh, first thing, uh, taking a lesson with a working player who plays Broadway shows is a great way to meet people in the community and introduce yourself. You want to be upfront about your goals, uh, say, you know, I really love to play for Broadway shows and ask them for their advice on your playing. Uh, you don't want to go in thinking you're going to wow them or really impress them because if they're, they're really a pro, they've already played with some of the best players in New York. So you really just, you want to get an honest assessment of where you are and where your abilities are. Don't try to schmooze them, they'll be turned off. Um, Second of all, uh, you want to, as uh, I believe was Ed said earlier, you want to do these kind of like minor league kind of uh, gigs, uh, playing high school and uh, college musicals. Uh, that will give you the experience that you might not get ordinarily uh, getting a music degree. Um, you really have to pay your dues. Uh, no one graduates school and automatically gets gigs because they think they're worthy of it. You really have to go out and meet people and play at a really high level. Um, and uh, networking really the moment you declare yourself a music major. Uh, you always want to be polite and professional. Uh, every colleague and teacher you have could be a potential employer you have someday. Um, you also want to develop good habits like punctuality, uh, personal hygiene. Uh, <laughs> I, know, I know it seems obvious, but you know, pit orchestras are very small and confined spaces. You don't want to make an unpleasant evening for your colleague that you're sitting right next to because uh, you forgot to put deodorant on or something like that. <laughs> Don't make that be the reason that you don't get called back, is all I'm saying. <laughs> Always dress professionally. Uh, a lot of people in pits now, they tend to uh, dress a little more casually. Uh, when you're a sub and you're young and you're just trying to break in, you really want to show that you take the gig seriously. Uh, you know, dress shirt, dress pants, similar attire to that. will show that you're there and you're serious. Just quickly, this next piece we're going to play was written for this conference uh, by one of the great arrangers in New York named Pete McGinnis. He's a Grammy Award nominated, multi Grammy Award nominated composer arranger. And what we did is we created a Broadway medley of tunes from various shows throughout the, uh, the decades and involving all of our doubles. So I hope you enjoy this. This is just Pete McGinnis' Broadway medley.